Okay, so let's start with a question, eh? I know some of the questions off the top of my head because I was and looking at the very slow and long. And then you can <laughs> Is that right? Out. Okay, so one of the questions was uh, as a nice little opener was around in your slides yesterday, yeah. all 143 of them. <laughs> you used a mountain image that you've used many times before. Is this you just building up to your own free solo? Uh, <laughs> actually, I actually thought, uh, is that working? No. Yeah, yeah you're on. Um, so yeah, free solo. I actually watched this movie, funny enough, when I flew from Boston to Seattle for DrupalCon. Um, and I'm obviously not gonna do a free solo, um, but it was a great movie. <laughs> Not a good question for me to talk long. Um, okay, another question was around. Um, not that long ago, you promised to write a recipe for the umami demo. How are we doing with that, Dries? Not very well. Um, but yeah, I'd love to. Um, Get a recipe in umami, and uh, I would especially like to have some photos. I'm, I'm more of a photographer than a than a cook or a chef, I should say. So I would actually love to take an existing recipe in umami, try to make it, and contribute a photo. So that would be that would probably be my step one. You know, maybe I can take a question from the room. Anybody questions from the room that they can speak out loud? I'll, I'll repeat the question too. Any questions from the room now? So I've been in session where we were talking about Edwin Uhari and looking at the competitor, uh, they were looking at WordPress or other cloud CMS. Considering we often sell to Drupal as a group file, a very uh, complete CMS. So creating a, a UI or experience which is more tailored towards a smaller WordPress so so I'll try to repeat the question. So how important is it to have a user experience that is tailored to smaller sites? Uh, no, uh, which is tailored to enterprise sites because going towards a smaller size may view the experience of the client. Yeah, it's interesting. So we actually think um, I actually think a lot of the improvements that we're making today are beneficial for everyone, you know, for both on the on the low end as well as the high end. And I think there's a long list of improvements we can make that are in the same vein. Um, you know, I think actually very few capabilities in Drupal Core are unique to the enterprise, um, in my mind, in, in terms of UI and offering experience. <laughs> okay, we're getting there, we're getting there. Actually, this is a good one, They're right at the top of this from Chris Albright. Uh, as Drupal has grown out of being primarily a hobbyist project into an enterprise one, how are we approaching and how are we attracting the next generation of developers? Yeah, no, it's a great question. It's not an easy question, um, you know, because I think a lot of people got into Drupal because it was so accessible. It was easy to kind of crack open the code and start making changes to it. Uh, and obviously, as Drupal has gotten um, you know more complex uh, because it's gotten bigger and bigger, and people have um, you know more and more use cases that they want to um, you know use Drupal for. Um, we've lost some of that accessibility of the code, meaning it's no longer as easy to just get involved and make changes. So it means that our art audience from a developer point of view, has changed a little bit from, you know, hobbyist developers, let's say, that can, um, you know, make changes in very little time to, um, you know, maybe, um, you know, there being a requirement to have um, sort of a more in-depth uh, background in programming, you have to know more concepts, you have to more, know more, you know, design patterns, which are maybe not um, you know, as easily thought as, you know, the Drupal that existed uh, 10 years ago. So, um, 
I think the way we attract more developers um, is through a variety of different things. I don't think there's a magic bullet here, um, but I do think we need to go to where these developers are. Like, I don't see uh, Drupal always being represented at developer conferences that would, um, you know, where it would make sense for Drupal to be uh, to be represented. Um, I don't think uh, Drupal is um, featured enough on certain websites either. Like a lot of web developers, um, you know, use or read websites like Smashing Magazine and these kinds of websites. Like we should really try and get. Um, you know, more articles about Drupal on those sites. Like, I think too often we're sort of in our own world, at Drupal cons, at Drupal camps, on Drupal.org, and not enough are we kind of getting off that island, if you will. Um, so are you saying we need, now we've got our code off the island, we need to get our image off the island yeah, as well? Yeah, so, I mean, I think there's, there's, there's an amazing story to do. I mean, it is amazing technology, and obviously, I like to think you all believe that, otherwise you wouldn't be here, but there's so much to like, there's so much to love, and we don't always do a good job telling that story and inspiring people um, that are not in the Drupal world um, you know, about that. So I think getting off the islands, going to conferences, writing guest articles or, you know, on other sites and, and also universities. And I'm going to schools and universities and telling people about the power of Drupal and how amazing it is and what a great career choice it is. Um, you know, all of these things um, are good. I think um, if you are an employer, take a bet on hiring new people, meaning people that don't know Drupal yet, and give them a chance to, to learn Drupal on the job. Um, we've actually done this at Acquia. Um, you know, we had a program where we would, um, you know, we hired uh, a bunch of developers, some of them uh, junior developers, some of them career changers, and we gave them um, paid training. So we basically paid them to learn Drupal at Acquia for six months. We did some classroom style training, we did some pair, um, you know, programming, all of these things, and at the end of six months, we gave them a, we offered them a job, which they didn't have to accept, right? It's kind of like, and they were like, wow, that's amazing. Like, you're gonna pay us for six months so we can train? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it makes a that, difference. Um, there might be a job for me too. Um, and so, a lot of people took that job, and still today, a lot of people are at Akia, and they're some of our most passionate, committed, loyal, uh, energetic employees that we have today. And you know, just the impact of them is so immense. And so I would definitely encourage organizations to, to really take a chance on, on new people and, and invest the time and energy to bring them up to speed. You know, I see too many organizations that want to hire senior developers and senior developers only. I was really encouraged. Uh, I had a meeting with quite a lot of business owners yesterday, and, and you, you partook in that as well. And they were really quite keen to actually start doing more collaboration together um, on training materials and sharing their own tra training materials with each other so that we get a, a more common framework and a larger number of people can use them. That's something you definitely support, I assume. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think, yeah, the more we can share, the better. I mean, our goes to our core DNA. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are open source after all. So I just noticed this question from Kevin Thull, which I love, which was, uh, what is, for those of us that don't know, what is the proper route to creating initiatives? What support happens if they're created? And as Kevin says, he's asking as the maintainer of the unofficial Drupal recording initiative. Yeah. How can we make sure that those initiatives for all sorts of things end up on your slides on a Wednesday morning? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's a good question. Um, I mean, so there's really multiple ways, but um, you know, sometimes initiatives are created kind of more like in a top-down manner. Uh, and we, we do that by looking at data. 
So for Drupal 8, um, we did a survey. I think over 3,000 people responded to the survey. And that allowed us to prioritize all the things people were asking for. Uh, we followed that up with other surveys. We followed that up with lots of conversations. Um, I spoke to hundreds, actually, um, of Drupal users and hundreds of agencies and uh, was vetted with the core committers and the product managers on the core committer team. And anyway, we went through, I guess, like a classic process, a product management process to come up with these initiatives. Um, and these are, many of those are the ones on the management, but not all of them. Um, other initiatives, and this is the part that I want to talk about most, um, is um, that the power of open source and the power of Drupal is that initiatives can be grassroots. There's a lot of great initiatives that have been created by people that decided to just do it. You know, like they said, we're going to do this, we're going to start an initiative, and then they started to have momentum and traction, and those also end up on the mountain. Right? And so it's important to recognize that um, things can come from different directions. And I think it's essential. I think it's essential to, um, you know, to how we innovate. Um, so yeah, like I mean, for an example would be, you know, Twig. And, you know, maybe this is going back a little bit more, but like I never, I never decided like, hey, let's do Twig. <laughs> the community took that initiative, people rallied around it, and, you know, it ended up in Drupal 8. There's a lot of other examples, but the point is, it can either be top down, and we'll start another cycle of doing the research and um, surveys, probably um, like a year from now when Drupal 9 is almost here, or maybe it's after this year. Uh, but in the meantime, by all means, keep innovating, keep organizing yourself, keep doing the things that you're passionate about and that you have conviction about, and, um, and start an initiative. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, I know from a pharmaceutical background that uh, attrition is a great thing. It's better to start a hundred things and just see which succeed than to never start them in the first place. Right. And Kevin is actually the perfect example of this, right? Let's, let's recognize that for a second. He's standing right there. Yeah. Woo! We kind of should be recording him now. Kevin, um, you know, Kevin decided to... Uh, start recording camps and cons, and has now recorded, I don't even know how many camps and cons, hundreds. And um, it's kind of an initiative. Well, it is an initiative. It was never, never did anyone go to Kevin, as far as I know, and said, hey, Kevin, let's start recording initiatives. No, Kevin decided to start doing this. And now he's scaling that as well, like he's making these video recording kits and, and powering others to do the same. So it's, it's actually an amazing example of, um, of sort of um, an initiative that just you know, emerged. Brilliant. Okay, so I've got one from Alana. I think she's in the room somewhere. Oh, hi. Um, it was about, you, you talked in the Dries notes about the privilege of time. How do we convince organizations to acknowledge the need to give developers and other contributors uh, time in to contribute during their work day? Yeah, no, I think, I think, and I've seen this and I've heard this, <laughs> um, there's a lot of kind of anecdotal evidence. Um, I don't know if like hard proof of this, but um, those that are actually involved in the Drupal community, those that do give back um, you know, as part of their job or in their free time, they actually become much better Drupal developers. Or you know, it doesn't have to be just developers, but let's talk about developers right now. So, um, you know, under, you, by collaborating with others in the Drupal community, you can actually learn so much, and you can learn it so fast. Um, you can go straight to, let's say, the people that help build the layout builder and ask them questions, right? And if you don't contribute, if you're not in the issue queues, if you're not at the events, it's a lot harder to do, and you have to do a lot more sort of self-exploration, right? Which could take a lot more time. Um, and so that's why organizations like, um, you know, the ones that I mentioned in my Dries note, Pfizer, and I think it was um, the state of Georgia as well. That's why when they, 
work with partners and they work with Drupal agencies, they will pick agencies that contribute back to Drupal, that, that they know are active in the Drupal community. And in the case of Pfizer, it's like, you know, Mike Lamb, um, who, who ended up running that, like he has a, like a quarterly review with each of his um, you know, Drupal agencies, and every quarter they need to show Mike what they've contributed back to Drupal. And if they don't con contribute, it takes them off the list of approved vendors. I mean, it's an amazing yeah. process. And he learned that that is how he gets the best results. That's how he avoids, you know, typical Drupal mistakes. Um, you know, and so, you know, I'm kind of going on and on, but um, there's a lot of benefits, um, not just for the individual um, that come from contributing, but also for the organization that the um, that the individual works at. Oh, okay, uh, I've got one from Darren. Uh, which I think we may have talked about before, actually. Will Drupal continue to be a complete product? Or is it moving towards just being a back-end component? Oh, that's a good question. I think, it will, I think it will be both for the foreseeable future. So I, I, the way I interpret that question, um, and maybe it's the wrong interpretation, the way I interpret that question is, you know, will Drupal also be coupled like will it exist in its traditional way where it provides um, a front end or will things move to being decoupled only, meaning you bring a front end uh, to Drupal. I don't know, is that where this is going, do you think? I think <laughs> um, so. But um, in my mind, the power um, of Drupal is that we do both. Um, and I, I actually do believe that um, a lot of users of Drupal need both. Like it makes a lot of sense to build uh, a traditional couple website, um, you know, maybe for your main marketing website because you get all the power of the layout builder and WYSIWYG, in-place editing, and accessibility, and search engine optimizations that Drupal ships with. But that same instance of Drupal could also power mobile applications, and, you know, what have you. And so the ability to mix and match the different delivery options is actually really powerful. I think it's a key differentiator compared to completely headless solutions, but also a key differentiator compared to um, sort of solutions that only do um, the traditional or coupled methods of content delivery. So it's a strength, and we should embrace the strength. Now, if in 10 years the market changes to being completely decoupled, great, we can follow that, right? So we're set up. Uh, we're in a position of strength where we have optionality for the future, but in the meantime, I absolutely think we should um, keep doing both. Yeah, good. <laughs> okay, I've got one from, in fact, I've got the same question from a couple of different people expressed in different ways. So Caroline uh, has asked, I was dismayed to see the recent Stack Overflow survey found Drupal a very dreaded framework. I love D8. I'm glad you love it, Caroline. Where's Caroline? Is she here? Ah, I love it, I love it too. Um, but where do you think we've gone wrong? And how do we fix it? I don't think we've gone wrong. Actually, if you look at the data, the last time I looked at the data, Drupal was in the top 20 most commonly used systems or in, and, or in the top 20 most loved systems and in the top 20 mo most hated systems. <laughs> and actually, that's a great place to be. <laughs> and actually, so was other software. If you look at all of the software that was kind of in the love and hated category, there are amazing names to be with. Like, it was like Linux, it was like WordPress, it was like really significant, highly successful open source projects that rank in both. So, you know, I think it's a little bit the nature of the beast, so to speak. <laughs> and uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I saw the data, Caroline, and I didn't think it was as worrisome as maybe maybe other people interpret it to be. I, I think we're just a very large project with lots of people that love Drupal, and sure, with lots of people that don't like Drupal. Um, and I think it's a measure of success. Oh, I've got an anonymous one. Anonymous? I don't think they're in the room. 
Um, I hope not. Uh, could there be a finance industry summit like the government one at the next Drupal cons? Yeah, I actually think so. There's a lot of um, financial organizations using Drupal, like some of the largest in the world, like you know, Citigroup. I think it's one of the largest banks in the world. They have standardized on Drupal. Um, Charles Schwab has a bunch of Drupal. Um, I mean, there's so many examples, and I, I think they're, um, you know, they have their own unique requirements around, you know, regulatory environments. I mean, there's probably a lot of, um, you know, best practices that could be shared amongst people in that industry. So yeah, I, the beauty of Drupal is actually that it's really strong in a lot of these verticals. I mean, we're really strong in higher education. We're really strong in media and entertainment. And so we have summits for some of these things. And then there is actually secondary verticals where we're also really strong, but they're maybe not in the top three or top four. Yeah. But it's not, um, yeah, it's, I mean, it, like we could actually have a summit for every vertical, I think, because you know, yeah, it's almost as though the summits could reflect Drupal.org case studies. Because right. if we're getting case studies, then right. they're definitely people. Right. Exactly. Uh, so yeah, I know we've recently launched a case study section on financial services. So maybe there people are out there. Good to hear. I believe it. Okay, so I have one from Sean. Uh, you miss you blah, blah blah. It's been a long week. When you met Matt Mullenweg, co-founder and of WordPress and Automatic. Did you discuss philosophies about open source or just CMSs in general? Huh, that's a great question. Yeah, so I've known Matt for a long time. Um, and so we, when our paths cross, we try to meet up and just hang out a little bit, you know, exchange notes. Um, and um, I don't know, we talk about a lot of different things, to be honest. <laughs> Uh, but we definitely talk about open source and content management and industry trends um, you know, and things that are going well and not well. Um, I don't know if there's a specific topic that we talk about. Um, but yeah, I don't know. <laughs> That's nothing that really jumps out at me. Like it's not like we secret, you know, secretly scheming things or something. It's just like more like socially. <laughs> Uh, talking about stuff without a real agenda, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's just like more of a friendship than, uh, you know, than trying to... That's good then, because we're all part of playing the same game, so right. being friends and working together with different people in different projects is a great thing. I, right. know, I know people in Joomla and it's, it's great, we, we do right. things. We should, you know, we're on the same side of the, the battlefield in, in many ways, right? We're, we're both... Um, we're all trying to advocate for open source. We believe in open source. So there's a lot of common ground. Um, and then, yeah, there's also things that we maybe don't look eye to eye about, and that's okay. Like, um, you know, kind of critique them about their, you know, not prioritizing accessibility as much as I think they should. And um, that's okay, we can disagree about those things. And when we meet, um, you know, we talk about it, but it's all very amicable. You know yeah. what I mean? So, um, I don't know, I think Matt has a lot of respect for Drupal and vice versa. Um, actually, people may not know this, but Drupal predated uh, WordPress. And ah! When WordPress was just launched, uh, WordPress.org was just a few pages, and one of the pages, um, actually, Matt gave credit to Drupal. Oh, no way! Yeah, yeah. I think that's been removed since. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, there's one for the way back so, machine. <laughs> so I do think we, you know, we kind of inspire each other or we kind of try and learn from each other. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to ask this one because I don't know whether we're going to be able to answer it here, but I think it might be something that we come back to later. Uh, and that's, um, we've changed DrupalCon somewhat this time. And in terms of the core sessions, we've compressed them down into two days rather than three days. So rather than being three short days, they are actually two long days now, uh, which I'm feeling right now, I must admit. Um, have you got any thoughts on that? Um, maybe, but I think at the end of the day, we should look at the survey results, right? Mm. My, my thoughts don't really matter. <laughs> I think on this topic, but uh, I think hopefully everybody will fill out uh, the survey. 
and provide feedback, and we'll look at that data. But um, you know, there's definitely things that I liked about the changes. I liked that we brought in um, a more diverse audience, that we reached out to the um, site owners and, and sort of business decision makers that actually write the check. <laughs> Um, you know, for building a Drupal site, I like that we incorp um, like you know incorporated marketers and content authors. So I think that's very good. I'm excited about that. At the same time, I heard a lot of developers say that an extra day would be better. You know, that two days is maybe too compressed. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, it, it's Fair an interesting rooms. one because I've got conflicting <laughs> conflicting thoughts on that as well. Because uh, one of the things that struck me was. Uh, you know, it, it costs money to come to DrupalCon, not just for the ticket, but also for being here. And if you've got two very long days, then it's one less day of a hotel cost. But you know, yeah. so I think that's why I, that's why I started up my answer with what I said. Like, let's look at the data, right? Yeah. And let's make data-driven decisions about how we want to keep evolving uh, DrupalCon. Um, yeah, yeah, because we want to make DrupalCon for you. So let us know. That's why we send out the surveys. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, so Avi has asked a question. Uh, Drupal has, over the history, been uh, has been late at solving for non-ambitious experiences. Is it still a good solution for the small business or non-profit with a small budget? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean. I think in many ways the answer is no, right? I mean, that's kind of the, the facts. Um, so when, when Drupal, you know, when I started Drupal, I mean, the market looked completely different. Um, there wasn't any software as a service to begin with. There wasn't a Wix, there wasn't a Weebly, there wasn't a Squarespace. And so like 10 years ago, people would come up to me and say, hey, how do I build a website for my daughter's soccer club or something? And I would say, yeah, it's Drupal, it's awesome. And today, I mean, it's a little bit harder to justify, right? Because there's so many good options to do simpler things faster and cheaper than with Drupal. And so I don't think that's a bad thing, just the way things have evolved. And so there's no denying that Drupal, um, you know, it's more expensive than some of these solutions that I just mentioned. Um, that doesn't mean Drupal is bad. Um, I will say that I reject the notion that Drupal is just for the enterprise. Mm. I've tried to explain this many times, and that's why I use the term ambitious digital experiences versus enterprise digital experiences. And I'll repeat it one more time. Um, <laughs> I've learned that I have to keep repeating myself until people repeat it back to me. <laughs> um, I know it's kind of a weird thing to say, but um, you know, I do believe that Drupal is for ambitious Nonprofits. I do believe that Drupal should be for ambitious startups or small organizations. If you want to do something new, if you want to do something very innovative, like if you're a nonprofit and you want to, you know, rethink how fundraising works, or if you want to do campaigns in a different way, that's going to allow you to break through. You know, like if you are a little startup called Airbnb and you want to build a business online. Like those organizations should be using Drupal, right? But they also probably have a slightly larger budget. And so that's why I reject the notion of enterprise, because to me, enterprise implies large companies with large budgets, and it excludes um, the ambitious smaller organizations, right? But if you're small and you have almost no budget, yeah, then maybe Drupal isn't the best choice. Um, that being said, there's a lot of examples of small organizations with very small budgets that are very successful with Drupal. Um, and so it's also not necessarily like, um, you know, off the table either. And we're also constantly making improvements to Drupal that actually makes it more um, accessible for the, the, the low end of the, of the market. Um, if you think about all of the things in 8.7 even, um, you know, the layout builder, um, the media management um, capabilities, all of these things actually benefit the low end and they benefit the, the, the high end. If you think about 
the work that we've been doing about making Drupal easier to upgrade, um, things like the automated updates initiative, uh, it actually, I believe it benefits the low end more than it benefits the high end more because in the enterprise, you have staff. You can afford to pay developers or retain developers through uh, a Drupal shop. That's the problem on the low end is like, you may not be able to have full-time staff or you may not even be able to hire somebody for a couple days a month. Some of these tools that we're building will actually allow that to happen again. And so it's kind of exciting that we can build things that actually benefit everyone. And if you look at the roadmap, product roadmap carefully, you'd see that a lot of these things are actually beneficial for everyone. Cool. Yeah. We have actually run out of time, but I'm going to ask two more questions, if everybody is okay with that. and will be more concise. Okay. Uh, this next one, I'd like to say something as well after you've said something. Okay, so it's an anonymous one. We still hear and see some inappropriate behaviour, particularly towards women, at after-hours events, often hard to address due to power differences. Can we stop it? Well, we have to. And so I think if you see something, you know, say something, right? I mean, that's where it starts in my mind. And so there are channels where um, you can go and you see these things. Um, you can email the Drupal Association, you can go to the Drupal Association staff, you can also come to me and uh, you know, share it with us so we can deal with it. And I, I will say that when these things have happened in the past, um, and I'm not aware of you know, every time something happens necessarily, um, but I have seen the staff deal with it very effectively. Um, again, I'm not saying it was the case every single time, but I do know that the staff takes it very serious. And based on what I've seen, is um, you know they're they're very serious about it. Thanks, Dries, because I'm quite I'm actually the code of conduct yeah. coordinator, right, so sorry, that's quite was, nice. Was <laughs> it, it kind of was. I just want to say one thing from the Drupal Association putting on the event. If you can't or won't behave appropriately uh, at events, you're not welcome. Simple as that. You're not welcome at DrupalCon if you can't behave appropriately. <laughs> and that goes for everyone. That goes for you. It goes for speakers. It goes for staff. It goes for me. It goes for you, Dries. <laughs> that would be awkward, but I would still do it. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, and I'll leave you with one final question to, to, it might be a little bit cruel. It is, what is the internet going to look like in 20 years? <laughs> what is the internet going to look like um, in 20 years? I don't know, but I do know one thing. Um, and, and this is like a philosophy from uh, Jeff Bezos. You know, like when he does product management, he doesn't ask, What's the future going to look like in terms of new things? But we often ask the question, what do we know will still be the same in 20 years? And let's double down on that, right? And so one thing that I do know is that everybody will be managing content. And in fact, they'll be managing more content than they're managing today. So as long as we keep improving Drupal's content management capabilities, I have a lot of conviction by Drupal still being here in 20 years. So. That is brilliant. Thank you very much, Dries. <laughs> thank you for all the questions. They're really appreciated. I can't get them all, but, you know, thank you. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> that was brilliant. <laughs> Uh, I was literally flicking through and they were just going. I, 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 I was literally, the way that we tried to do it. Okay. Yeah, but I was choosing questions that were, e uh, that were easy to make a conversation. Yeah. Okay. Oh, no way, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
Thanks, Trace. Oh, got that still on. <laughs>